everyone. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to start out with a pressing question I think that we've all had since November, um, since the election, uh, the state of government funding. So I know it'll be a probably quick answer, but maybe start with you, Mark, and then we can move down as needed. Yeah, so we're, we are fully funded through 2017 um, as the result of a continuing resolution, and we continue to do our work, and we are holding the course, the programs that we continually and traditionally offered are still being offered now, and uh, you know we're hopeful for 2018 and whatever comes from there, but we need you, you know, to, to apply, to continually apply, so we can keep the justification for these programs alive. We need you as reviewers. We need you in the field. Um, doing the work that you're doing that really makes our mission lived and real and gives us the opportunity to do the work that we're charged with. Um, so it is very much holding the course right now and, uh, and we're quite happy to do it. That was well put. Um, I'm just going to reflect that entire statement and just plop in the NEA for that as well. Uh, we're also fully funded through 2017. We're continuing to um, uh, get applications uh, and take in applications for all of, of our regular grant deadlines. So uh, keep them coming. Uh, yeah, same story at the National Institutes of Health. Um, our budget has continued on. I think we might actually have gotten a slight bump up this year, in fact. So we continue to accept <laughs> applications across all of biomedical and behavioral health research. And on the receiving end, uh, IWARE has funding from NIH and IARPA, and that funding didn't disappear, so that's great. Still going. Oh yeah, so uh, Playmatics, uh, we've been holding study course as well. We're, we're participating on a few grants. One in particular I'm excited about with the uh, National Institute of Mental Health. So we're staying the course as well, uh, which we're happy to share. Okay, great, great to hear. Can we hear a big exhale from the, <laughs> from the audience? Um, so I would love to hear um, you all talk about what you're most excited about. If there are hot spots um, for funding, especially in the realm of impact games and digital media, um, what you're looking forward to this year out of your different funding programs. I mean, I'll just step back and just, just say what we do you know, at the NEH, yeah. the National Endowment for the Humanities. And it is to primarily, we're charged with funding humanities projects that reach a broad swath of the US public. It is taxpayer dollars. So we are using your money to fund projects that we hope reach you, or your constituencies, or certain portions of that, um, of those constituencies, educational contexts, um, contexts with informal learning those that would reach people via public media, such as PD, PBS, and then increasingly um, the work that I do in the program that I lead, which is digital projects. So we fund everything from games to mobile apps to web experiences, VR and XR types of projects are, are very much on our radar, especially as how they pertain to museums and historic sites and the use of those as tools towards public programming. And we do it primarily through a, a program called Digital Projects for the Public, offer a deadline, or deadline is once a year in June, so we just missed it, unfortunately. Um, but we are excited, really, to see what the field is, is going to do in terms of pushing in this direction. And that does extend, of course, to civics in some sense, but also to literature, history, philosophy, culture, those sorts of things that I think a lot of the work that you're doing and some of the work that's been showcased this Games for Change, um, Walden being one of those, um, really does suggest, and I think that the humanities have a huge, huge role to play in growing innovation in the game space, as well as using games to grow innovation in the educational portion of the humanities. So there's nothing in particular that we look for. We use you as a, a guide in some ways, so we can be responsive to the field and what we fund. And given that, that um, these, these signals are coming very, very clearly in terms of, of what needs to happen in order for the humanistic side of the industry to grow, you know, we're trying to do what we can. We offer three levels of support, discovery, prototyping, and production. So we really do try to, to keep um, a project funded at every single stage, and I think that's crucial. I can talk more about that in a bit, though. <laughs> Wow, I should have been sitting over there because I just <laughs> want to take that again. Um, so uh, from, from um, my perspective, so I just started at the NEA about a year and a half ago. Uh, I'm the media arts director, which is kind of a growing and changing discipline. Uh, people often ask, well, how, do, how does this fit into media arts? What is media arts? Um, so uh, for us, I'm kind of excited about um, games coming into the media arts discipline. Uh, since 2012, that was something that was specifically called out in the guidelines. That was an acceptable 
uh, discipline. I think that was new for the NEA to really step, step up and have that in there. Uh, so I think that there's still some uh, head scratching in the community of like, how does this fit into the arts? Uh, but uh, game design is an art form. Uh, the work that you guys are doing is clearly part of the creative sector. Uh, so for us in the artworks discipline, for uh, in the artworks category of funding, it is about art working in communities and, and doing the work that, that you guys are doing here with um, Games for Change and um, doing issue-based uh, projects. So. I think for us, um, it's really exciting to see the different types of projects that were coming in. Uh, for media arts, it's film, television, radio, interactive works, internet-based works, things that are virtual reality are now coming into our discipline. Um, so I, I think I'm really excited about projects that are fluidly engaging, though, uh, around all, all of those different mediums. And people are really taking advantage of that. And organizations are really stepping up to the plate and making sure that the uh, programs that they are uh, orchestrating to serve artists are um, kind of serving all of those needs. So there's kind of a wide palette of things that I'm excited about. Um, I'm excited to see what, what else is happening in the field. Uh, so I like to do phone calls with people and hear about their projects and learn about what they're thinking about. Um, hear about their largest challenges. So at any point, if there's something that uh, anyone in this audience is interested in bouncing ideas off of us and just telling us where you're at, um, please tap us as a resource because that helps us also attune our um, project categories and, th and things like that. So um, I guess there's just always things to learn. Great. And David, how about at the NIH? What kind of projects do you fund and are excited to fund, hopefully, in the near future? Uh, sure. So the National Institutes of Health is a collection of 27 institutes and centers, and we're the, we're the primary uh, federal funding agency for uh, basic uh, biological and health and behavioral research uh, within the federal government. So we fund everything from sort of, you know, uh, basic intracellular uh, mechanisms and research into, uh, you know, uh, behavior and uh, uh, human endeavor, and then uh, everything up through sort of up to the point of, like, you know, giving health care. Um, and what's key to all those pieces is that we also fund underlying technologies for those, right? So while we funded, you know, a science discovery game like iWire, we've also funded um, the sort of like underlying technology for performing crowdsourcing and citizen science that uh, Playmatics has also been funded for. So it's like we're a very, very broad agency in terms of what we fund. And um, in addition, there are very few restrictions on the type of organization that can be funded. We can fund nonprofits, NGOs, um, uh, for-profit businesses, uh, uh, academic institutions is our bread and butter, but we certainly have, you know, small business initiatives and, and uh, technology transfer initiatives as well. So there's many, many, many different funding opportunities, um, uh, some targeting very specific areas of science and others, you know, the sort of omnibus that which you can submit, you know, any proposal that you can think of and uh, well, it'll be, you know, funneled through receipt and referral to a particular area that has expertise. And, and Amy and Margaret, I know you've both been recipient, recipients of NIH grants. Could you talk a little bit about, maybe starting with you, Margaret, what types of, um, of funding you've received, what types of projects that you've been working on with that? Yeah, so um, I'll try to make this as succinct as possible because I have a few points I really want to share with the audience. So Playmatics did not start out as um, someone who, a company that was pursuing federal funding, although I have a weird background in public health from the early 90s tobacco control. Uh, I never thought I, it would ever come in handy or useful <laughs> in my tech and game industry career. Um, however, in the past, I'd say five or ten years, uh, five years or so, we've been really involved in, in bringing what we've uh, learned and established in the entertainment industry. My co-founder is uh, one of the lead designers of Diner Dash, a really huge hit. So we have a lot of entertainment industry experience. And we also have a lot of commercialization and productization experience. So we've been really, I think, pretty effective, and that's why we still are standing here today as a, as a game company that's based in New York City, and really outreaching to other industry sectors. Because right now, the game industry is, you know, it, it has its challenges. And uh, we made alliances with scientists and researchers and healthcare practitioners and artists and who, who um, would need our uh, skills. And so it's a really nice combination of skills. Um, we have two projects right now that are in clinical trials, um, one having to do, ironically, with smoking cessation, um, tobacco prevention, which I never thought would come in handy in my life ever 
from the, those days. We have another one that is uh, showing promising results that I'm not allowed to talk about that deals with ADHD. Um, and like I said, we're on an NIMH uh, grant right now. We just signed a memo of understanding with a pretty well-known um, group here that I'm also not allowed to talk about, but um, we're going to be pursuing the model of games as art. We really feel that games consistently throughout my career get underserved in terms of attention, both in the tech space, but also in the artistic space. If film can be considered art or photography, so can games. So we're working with organizations to um, and museums to um, create a game that is considered an art form, but that does have an educational component, um, namely a STEM component. So those are the kinds of things that interest us, the, the bridging of talent of uh, the researchers with people like us who've, who've raised venture capital before, who've raised angel investment and, and know the tough, nitty gritty world of uh, that, that, that scene. Um, we, we can be really useful, I think, a nice compliment. Cool, yeah, so from the iWire standpoint, we have a couple of different projects. So we have uh, the UH2 from NIH that is uh, a, an interesting kind of collaboration between our group, which spun out of a computational neuroscience lab at MIT and is now principally affiliated with Princeton University. Um, but we're kind of teaching a class with Drew Davidson at CMU where we will be, uh, and also teaming up with Jesse Shell of Shell Games to build a version of iWire 2. So just a little background, iWire is a citizen science game. Uh, we have a couple hundred thousand users who come in and solve 3D puzzles, and as they solve those puzzles, they're actually mapping out neurons. So it's human intelligence plus machine intelligence, um, and they're helping us figure out how the brain works, how cells connect and identify new types of cells. Um, we have another project that's part of the BD2K with, uh, with some other researchers abroad and at MIT that's doing browser-based annotations of, of MRI. Um, and then we're also a part of the IARPA microns program. Um, I think another, I, there's a really important aspect, I think, of you know, funding these citizen science games that often doesn't get noticed outside of the world of science, and that's the scientists are learning so much from the gaming industry. You know, most labs have no designers, even though they might have incredibly beautiful 3D models or great data that can be visualized. Um, you'll probably never find a research lab that has a UI UX designer or maybe even that knows what UX is. Um, and so this idea of getting the public to help with science is you know, one hurdle that's huge to get past, but also that the scientists can learn from this industry and work collaboratively with this industry to create tools that are more easily used by their peers um, is huge. And I think that's a, a huge external benefit of funding in this arena that often kind of doesn't even get yeah, mentioned. I don't know if I answered the question. No, that's great. And okay. that segues into my next question, which okay. is um, back to the funders. Um, what are some unique opportunities? That's one of them, of, um, of game projects and applicants, um, applications coming from game studios um, or scientific research groups um, who are working with developers. Um, what do you see? What are some unique sort of challenges and opportunities of those types of projects? I mean, I'd say in our case, you know, it helps us grow young again in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think the NEH is both for right and, and, and wrong reasons associated with the kind of traditional, at least my division is, PBS documentary, the type of thing where the younger demographic skews 49 to 64. And given that, you know, we're excited to use games as a, a real vessel into classrooms, yes, but also in, into informal learning spaces that does reach a younger demographic and introduces them to some of what can only be termed the kind of gloriously messy world that the humanities can offer. I mean, the humanities, in, in terms of games, too, can deal with things that I think um, very much are involved with the deeper processes of introspection, of research, of exploring context and contingency, causality, the sorts of things that we might talk about more broadly in a large, larger research paper, or think about in terms of big moments in history, but in terms of creating a situated learning space where players can actually explore these things themselves, can take the perspective of Thoreau, or in the case of other games that we funded, um, live their lives as someone through, who is really struggling with what it means to be a part of the American Revolution or the Civil Rights Movement, or what it means to really work across religions to find sorts of um, corollaries that would stick or in the case of one, another um, game that we had funded, uh, what it means to chase down smallpox in Philadelphia and 
how the social and cultural and historical um, aspects of that disease are just as important as the medical. So for us, this is an exciting space, but it's one that I think um, is very much in its infancy, all the same, and that may be the most exciting part of it uh, in terms of being able to offer funding and support for this, is I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg for this. Even in terms of what we're seeing sticks as far as learning goes, and a lot of the meta-analyses that are supporting work in humanities and in gaming, I think we're very much at the threshold of, of some potentially very big breakthroughs. And, um, and yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. So what can, what can the creators, what can the developers do to, um, to show these folks um, the importance of funding their work? Um, what, what have you found to be some kind of key communication tools or strategies to, um, to include in your application? I think um, for the NIH's perspective, actually partnerships are a key mm -hmm. point. Sort of multidisciplinary research is, is the norm mm -hmm. now, right? Even in sort of, you know, informatics tools that people are developing, well, if it's meant to be eventually in the hands of a clinician five years from now, you better have a clinician on staff, right? Someone who knows, you know, clinical workflows, knows how to interact with patients, right? Otherwise, you know, that tool is being developed in a vacuum. So if you're submitting in a game, the same, you know, the same applies. And there's a number of funding opportunities actually specifically targeting games that even leverage that. So um, my colleague Tony Beck runs a program called the Science Education uh, Partnership Awards, and um, those uh, leverage this idea of partnering game developers with educators and um, uh, biomedical researchers to come up with some project that has an educational component, gets um, K through 12 students out into the field and doing some type of, you know, a, a scientific project, right? So whether that's sort of, you know, cataloging people getting sick or, you know, collecting, um, you know, microbiota and, and uh, evaluating those through a lab that they then have access to because of their partnership with some biomedical researcher. These are the kind of projects that, um, you know, sort of uh, are meant to act as sort of a gateway into uh, funding through uh, the NIH. And um, for successful projects that come through that sort of early stage program, you can then come back in as, you know, a small business uh, a, a grant or a technology transfer grant. So in, in a way, the, the hope is with the NIH is to have the sort of pipeline of funding opportunities that can, you know, lead you through a full process of, you know, initial idea to some, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, project that can eventually, you know, stand up on its own and, uh, you know, uh, receive additional funding. Uh, I, oh, go ahead. Do you? I can speak to it really quickly. Sorry, I didn't want to jump on, on your words. Um, just really quickly, I think w something that uh, creatives or, or game developers can do, first of all, is, is really understand what the different grants mean and what the different phases mean and to understand uh, what's required. Uh, it's good to get be good at grant writing and to understand uh, how to write and help co-write those grants so that you're an active part of it. Another thing is really just a, a healthy, I think, respect and understanding that this is taxpayer money. And we're always responsible to do well by our investors, but I think there's an, a special le level of, of um, you know, responsibility that comes with that terrain. And I, I also think that um, knowing um, what is needed to satisfy the goals of a particular funding raise, uh, you know, because a lot of times, uh, you know, when we started working in this area, we would work with folks who wanted to, you know, do everything all at once with a phase one grant, and often that is a cross-purpose with what the grant is supposed to do. So it's really important to understand those nuances to whatever extent you can, and also to sign up for all of the different grants.gov, sbir.gov, all of the sites, just get an account before you need it. Actually, I'm just gonna build on that, because what you said was really important, and this is about aligning, um, not changing your project, but just aligning the types of um, outcomes that you're hoping to get from your project with the agency that you're coming in to um, apply for. And so I think um, just go making sure that you're familiar with that and going on a federal agency's website and really just starting from the beginning and looking at the about page and the mission. <laughs> and it's very much um, kind of, it seems so simple, but you, you would be surprised at how many people don't really think about it like that. You really have to think about um, this from the perspective of the agency. So uh, for us, we, and probably all the other agencies have the criteria that every panelist who is reviewing your application will look at to judge your application. And if you're not looking at that in advance while making your narrative for the project, um, and if you're not giving the panelists the answers that they need, um, then 
then it's going to be pretty challenging. But I think that there's a lot to be learned about knowing, um, um, kind of knowing how to answer those questions in a way, and also having the right partnerships that can help you answer those questions, um, and also knowing what other types of funding is available um, that might be a precursor to federal funding. So there's uh, state funding, there's uh, local and regional funding at the arts and humanities level um, that you could be coming in for. So there's just kind of a wide range of, that's like a whole other world in the government side. <laughs> Yeah, and let me just offer something about NEH, and I'm not sure if it meshes with what NIH or NEA does, and it's that we actually work with you on proposals. So the mm -hmm. first bit of advice that I would say if you're thinking about an NEH project is simply to get in touch with us. We'll oftentimes um, play a role in helping you build scholarly teams, teams of content experts, which are a requirement for us. We have a good idea of the trends that are taking place in scholarship, which in some sense, oftentimes, for me at least, translates into ways of boundarying a certain game or an idea or a narrative built within it, a game framework. And we will go all the way down off as well, you know, right to the deadline, even line editing with you folks at different points to try to clarify what your ideas are. We do not take letters of interest. We don't work like other funders in that direction. Everything that comes our way, as long as it, it, it adheres to some minimal um, aspects of the guidelines, is accepted and is put through peer review. So it really does matter in terms of your competitiveness that you speak with us in order to align some project goals and outcomes like Jack's mentions, um, but also to get a sense from the inside what we're seeing in terms of, of where directions are with, with certain types of projects and with certain types of content. And it is a taxpayer service, and it is one thing that I very proudly say, you know, as a public servant, we offer to you um, as part of our agency. So please, by all means, get in touch with us. It doesn't happen enough. Yeah, that's really amazing that you offer that. We don't offer that at the NEA, uh, but you can call us. <laughs> and we do have very specific instructions on our website, so always look at those. Download the application PDF in advance before you call us. You'd be surprised how many people just call us, like, hey, we're looking for funding, can you help me? And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but um, that's one thing. Do you guys also offer feedback to applicants if they we don't do. get? And you, and you can do that at the NEA too. So even if you don't get a grant, or even if you do get one, call for the feedback, because that's really helpful in, in understanding how your application was read. That's, the, crafting a narrative is another art form. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, yeah, and, you and, know this. And just a, one last thing too. We do have access to samples from funded proposals too, um, and we'll oftentimes help you unpack what's applicable there. Um, there's a lot that we can do that isn't usually communicated as part of our mission. And I think uh, we need to get better about that, but you know, this is one way of doing that. So by all means, get in touch. Yeah, absolutely, at the NIH, please get in contact. In fact, you can call me up and say, hey, I have an idea, can you fund me? Um, what I will do is talk about your research uh, proposal, your ideas, and uh, more than likely direct you to some other component of the NIH that you know, really has the expertise. Um, the NIH is uh, staffed, I don't know the percentage, but it's probably upwards of 60%, you know, PhD scientists with areas of expertise in various parts of uh, biomedical uh, science research. Um, and yeah, we have similar you know, resources. We have example fun, you know, uh, uh, applications that have you know, been successful in the past. Uh, we use peer review. I don't know if you use yeah. program review or not, but we use a peer review system that's actually completely separate from, from you know, myself, the programmatic side. So in fact, I also can, you know, and, and any program officer at the NIH can talk with you throughout the entire process of developing your project and submitting to it. You know, and submitting it for review, and then post review, we can discuss your you know summary statements, the review comments, and you know think about a possible resubmission. Um, if if your the review process can be a bit of a black box, I think at a lot of agencies, certainly the NIH, uh, but there are resources online where you can s spend a lovely hour or two watching through a sort of mock review um, that's uh, you know that, that that shows you all the different steps and things that uh, you would want to put into an application, as you were saying. Yeah, and just to say, there's no stigma attached to resubmission either. Yeah. And, um, you know, we just had a project, a film, that had submitted eight times, and had gone through the process, and had taken reviewer comments seriously, and had actually honed the project in each submission, and finally got to the point where they received funding. Yay. And in some ways, I mean, that's really, really gratifying to see that process actually work, and it does. I mean, as Jack's noted, you know, working through guidelines from federal government programs um, do force you to reframe your project in certain ways, but there's a process that we privilege that I do think works if you take it seriously. Um, 
maybe not eight times, seriously. But. Yeah. And that actually can make your project stronger yeah. because you're starting to think about the different aspects of distribution and outreach and your, part, your real strategic partners that can help bring your project to a new level. So think about, think about us, uh, think of us as collaborators, I yeah. guess, through that process. Yeah. Yeah. That is I can, I, oh, go ahead, I can, va I can vouch for the NIH process as Mark and I worked together on our Games for Change Student Challenge um, grant that we were fortunate enough to receive uh, this past year on our um, youth uh, immigration games program. Um, so I would love to hear, Mark, some of the things that you've learned from all those conversations with, um, with those applicants. And, um, and Amy and Margaret, the, the daunting process of uh, the federal grant applications, um, the long RFPs, the sometimes unpredictable cycles and, um, and <coughs> length of time that it takes to work through the process. So, some words of maybe inspiration or advice to um, to our developers and creators in the audience from all that you you three have learned. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, it's it's the one thing that usually stands out is when I'm getting speaking with folks like yourselves, who, on, for the most part here, and I'm over generalizing, work much more on the the production end than maybe in terms of content expertise, is the ability to actually take a subject or a historical event or a book or something like that and not just go out and find the best researchers for it, but figure out ways to synthesize that type of information for a general public audience. And this goes beyond the kind of traditional model where, you know, by putting something out there, the, the more traditionally defined digital humanities model, by putting open archives out there, we're making it public. In our case, it needs to be more refined than that. Content has to be narrativized in some sense. It has to be synthesized and it has to be translated in a way that speaks to the strengths and mechanics of the game. So the one thing I constantly hear you know, through the process is how do I figure this out? How do I build this into my own development process in a way that works? And how do I build a team that's responsive in that way? And the shorter answer is there really isn't any one size fits all solution to that. But you do need folks on your team and this has consistently been borne out by the projects that did receive funding. You need to find the people who can speak both languages or multi-languages. You need the, you know, the multilingual folks who can understand at least partially what's at stake in terms of game mechanics. Or you can have someone on board who can explain that to them. And then that exchange of ideas between content experts and producers really matters. Now the good news is on our end, we recognize how difficult that is, especially to get those conversations off the ground initially. So we built in discovery funding into the program, which is a short $30,000 grant that actually pays content experts and media producers to get together in a room and hash out really what's at stake and build the framework and the fundamental basis for moving forward with the project. Um, but yeah, there's uh, an awful lot in the details in terms of, of what matters there. Margaret or Amy, one of you, tricks of the truth. Sure. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I'm relatively new to the grant space. I came from health, working in healthcare before running iWire and background in crowdsourcing. Uh, and so I guess the advice that I would say is get with someone who's written grants before and who has won grants before <laughs> because it's, yeah. uh, it was, you know, it was a little daunting to me. Um, however, it's a good learning process and it does really make you think through your project and through your goals and your entire plan and just, you know, so much writing and iterating and really honing it in and, you know, kind of getting feedback along the way is, um, is really helpful, you know, and it's also not incredibly fast. So, you know, in the case of iWire, we also had supplementary funding from different foundations uh, and also from Korea Telecom, from a company in, um, I can talk about that, <laughs> not really in this context, but um, yeah, supplementing the, the grant and, and just planning ahead for, there's this kind of a long window before you'll know the answer and you might be producing within that window, so just plan accordingly. You could probably give more. <laughs> no, not at all. Do, do you want to? Uh, okay, I'll just speak really quickly to it. I really wasn't kidding when I said get, get logged in. If you need an ERA Commons uh, ID, get it before you need it. Get it months <laughs> before you need it. Get sign up for, and there are multiple websites whose databases don't necessarily talk to each other. Some of them do, some of them don't. Familiarize your, yourself with that sooner rather than later. Um, you know, sometimes with grant writing, you know, I, I used to work at the Department of Public Health in Massachusetts, so I used to help write RFPs, lucked into that job. 
Um, but you know, sometimes when you're reviewing proposals, uh, one question one asks, if, if it's just you don't know the team, is, is this person, are these people just really good at writing grants? Um, because that is a skill, and can they really execute and implement? So uh, I just think um, bringing together all of your, your faculties and everything you've taken with you to, to form your life experiences. So I had a background in social science and research, luckily, in public health. So just it just came in handy. And, and just get started sooner rather than later. And literally, uh, I think the, the, the federal funding agencies do a very good job of explicitly down to the minutia explaining to what is expected. And if you really just follow that, I mean, line for line, and it takes a long time, I think you'll be in good shape. But if, if, if one tries to shortcut the process, um, and I've done that recently, something we just, just we're just too busy, um, it's, you know, you'll just submit it again, <laughs> hopefully, after one takes in the review or comments. So it's just really, honestly, just understanding the bureaucracy and, and working with it and, and treating it like a game. You know, it's like a game. And, and honing in on the specifics, and it's something that Dave and I were talking about kind of before coming out, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of have this big, broad ambition and this huge goal, but often what you are actually submitting is a really specific, drilled-in project, so try to make it as kind of as specific and to the point as possible seems to be helpful. And also building on that, um, not getting too into the weeds though with technicalities, because mm. sometimes the people who you're pitching the project to might not know the specifics of like the game platforms and all the nitty gritty stuff that you're using, but really they, it's, it's specific, but it's also broad enough that yeah. people who might not be so entrenched in that particular activity um, can understand what's happening in your application. Um, and also, I was just thinking when you were talking, it's kind of like, imagine if your proposal was going to Shark Tank and those people <laughs> just, what are they gonna rip apart? What are the panelists going to ask? And um, thinking about that ahead of time and addressing that in your application, thinking about, hmm, if I was sitting on the other end of that, what things would I need to do to demonstrate feasibility? What do I need to make sure that's in the budget to demonstrate that I'm thinking and that I've done this before and I know that these funds will adequately cover the project? Uh, are we paying? Are, are we paying creatives in here, are, are we kind of like covering up all of those loose ends? So if you're really thinking about it like that and you're approaching it like it is a game in a sense, um, you're not only making sure that you have a well-rounded project, but the people who are on the receiving end of the proposal can ask all the questions and have answers there. And if you don't have answers there, then you can't, a panelist can't guess what's going to happen. So some things might be obvious, but um, if you haven't put it in your application, then we can't just come to a conclusion that this type of outreach plan will happen or um, these people are going to get paid. Uh, so that's just something also to think about. Thank you. Um, so we've got a few minutes left. I have one more question or sort of set of questions. Um, David, I want to go back to the point that you made about partnerships and the kind of criticality of bringing cross-sector partners together, um, both for the application process, but also to sustain funding after that first grant cycle ends mm -hmm. and after those funds might run out. Um, can, I'd love to hear some examples of, I know Margaret, you're working on some interesting joint venture partnerships. Um, Amy, your work with Korea Telecom. Um, and David, work that you've done um, or grants that you've um, made to kind of coalitions of partners that have really been successful. Did you, was it? Go ahead. <laughs> uh, sure, so um, let's see here. A couple of years ago, we, um, Amy mentioned a UH2 opportunity. That's just a code that means sort of an early staged two year, I think half a million dollars or so altogether uh, funding opportunity. Um, so we had, we funded 10 of those projects, right? And most of them are just beginning their second year. Um, a few of them though, based on what they built on that initial sort of high risk, high reward is the intent of the, uh, of the UH2 mechanism. Um, you know, the, the projects that they built and the partnerships that they, you know, assembled before, you know, submitting to that funding opportunity, they've then taken that one step forward. So as an example, they may have been using, you know, a, a gamified crowdsourcing platform for, um, you know, improving some machine learning algorithms um, for doing a certain task. And uh, they have now come back in um, to uh, improve those algorithms uh, uh, based on this sort of, you know, initial platform. Um, I don't know if we've made any awards yet, um, so I don't think I can say anything specifically, but it's exciting to see how, you know, sort of, as I was saying earlier on, this sort of pipeline of funding opportunities um, intended to, um, to uh, you know, support, um, uh, you know, game developers and biomedical scientists and everyone in, uh, in, 
continuing their research. And, and I should make a comment, actually. We, we, we sort of understand that it's sort of a daunting hard sell, right? You're, you're putting something together sort of on spec, and then depending on the funding agency, it might be a year until you even hear back that, oh, you just barely didn't make it, and now why don't you try to resubmit again, right? And that, that can be real challenging, I understand. But the reward is also there, right? And it's just sort of a, a, a decision you need to make, right? Because for successful applicants, um, and um, for, especially for us, resubmissions, the success rate more than doubles, actually, at the NIH. I don't know how it is at other institutions. Um, so uh, be, uh, be, 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 be because of that, um, we, uh, we, we do see pro, you know, projects come back in, and um, you know, once you're successful, you have two, three, four, five years of, of funding that you can, um, can rely on. Um, go ahead, Mark. Uh, you know, our recent partnership with the Scripps Research Institute, where we created a, a citizen science game portal. You know, I, I have a background in working on game portals. I was part of shockwave.com way back in the day. And so it was really awesome to um, develop an, an initial instantiation of this portal, uh, you know, inspired by sites like congregategate.com or Miniclip, but then to work with the scientists in the field, so UCSF, for example, or the Scripps Marine Research Institute, uh, you know, to listen to their specific needs and to work with them one-on-one -on -one, um, around things like data collection, um, trying to figure out schematas to share data across different initiatives uh, and, and institutions. It, it really strengthened what we were building because um, we were developing um, partly based on our collaborations. So if we had a Quest system, you know, one UCSF needed the Quest system to be uh, something that could be sequentially ordered, and you know, they tested it on their grad students, and it was uh, a really uh, strengthening um, exercise to go through for the product. And on the iWire front, so we have many external collaborations. Um, they kind of originally started for you know funding the game. They've also extended to like Microsoft Research building you know virtual reality experiences that engage the general public and get them stoked and you know want to help us map the brain in this project. Um, but specifically with Korea Telecom, so we had a, an interesting and sort of unique for the citizen science world partnership. It was not a sponsorship, it was a partnership because KT sponsored us for two years with pretty substantial funding. Um, but they also launched a huge advertising campaign nationally in South Korea. Um, we translated the game into Hangul, into Korean. Um, we hired Korean community managers. There were competitions across all the technology high schools. There were national TV ads. And the, the motivation for this is that, you know, iWire is a little bit client heavy and it uh, is a little slow to load if you don't have fast internet. Well, Korea Telecom provides gigabit internet service to Korea. And so they ran an ad that basically was saying gigabit internet service is helping us map the brain. Um, the, the challenge of that is that they don't usually run these things by us. They just kind of, you know, will send you this <laughs> ad that they're running nationally, starting like right now. Um, but it was really effective as far as building an audience, building an international audience. Our participants really loved getting to know, you know, Koreans and, and, and whatnot. Um, yeah, so that was a kind of interesting sort of experiment. Um, it, there was also kind of the, frankly, just the, the downside where it was a little bit the kind of company decided what kind of competitions they wanted to run locally in Korea. So for example, they would give away cash prizes. Uh, and that is a huge disincentive for a citizen science project because the moment those cash prizes come up, people start cheating, which you don't normally have in citizen science. Uh, and then they also stop playing as soon as those cash prizes are gone. So, you know, it kind of a, has a little bit of catch-22. But I think there's, there's so much opportunity for external collaborations with labs, with schools. We do internship programs. We do all sorts of things that, you know, and, and lots of in-kind sponsorships as well to supplement what, you know, what's coming in from other funders. Great, thank you. Um, so thank you so much. Um, we'd love to open this now to your questions. Um, so I know we have two mics um, and the Games for Change volunteers um, in red t-shirts on either side. So I saw your hand up first, so. 
Okay, John Jeremy, I put people in projects together at the United Nations. And the obvious question for my point of view is, you know, federal funders and artists sounds very US centric, but we just had a wonderful example of uh, a project that was clearly you know, international. You know, so I'm wondering, you know, from the point of view of the agencies represented here, you know, how would it be seen if, as part of the collaboration, a partner, let's say two identical projects, you know, one of which has all US collaborators and the other has international collaborators, does it make a difference? You know, and is there anything that you, you know, that you think we ought to know about you know, language and culture, you know, which you know, can be very, you know, uh, very different depending on what people's uh, focus are? Is there something that would be prioritized or seen as less important? Yeah, but the main thing is the main question is about uh, international collaborations. And do you have opposite numbers to federal agencies? Do you have opposite numbers in other countries that you deal with? And you know, is that relevant to us in any way? Thank you. So for international partnerships, absolutely. I would say most um, most of the NIH funding opportunities, and it's it's listed there actually. Uh, you know, in, in each funding opportunity, you know, uh, what's unfortunate the unfortunate name of foreign entities, but you can look through and see. Um, uh, the, 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 for most, you need to be, the, the person who is submitting or the institution who is submitting needs to be U.S. based, um, but there are many that aren't. But you can have collaborations with anyone, you know, anywhere around the world. I, the only limitation I'm aware of is we have to have diplomatic relations with them, so maybe North Korea is not a good pick right now. Um, but that's, that's pretty much the, the only limitation. As far as language and culture, I, I think absolutely. There's certainly cultural, um, you know, uh, uh, relations to health. Um, within sort of you know certain communities, um, language I'm not quite so familiar with, um, but um, you know if there's technology that you're building, sort of natural language processing that maybe has some, you know you're localizing some informatics tool for language within a particular area to you know explore the, you know electronic health records or something like that, and that could certainly be something that uh, we could explore for funding as well. I, I expect other funding agencies have a good bit of interest in language and culture as well. <laughs> Yeah, we do have a, a special initiative that's, that's preserving endangered languages at the NEH, and it extends across every division, every grant line we offer. There is a special call for that kind of work. Um, in our case, it's, it's more of the same. Yeah, we, we are completely okay with international collaborations, with a couple of little caveats. One, same sort of thing. It needs to be a request from a US-based fiscal sponsor that is a 501c3 or an institution itself um, that works through those, those um, particular entities. And we do say, too, that generally, you know, if you're, if you're building a game on, say, Muncie, Indiana, it might not make so much sense to have a scholar on board from Ireland speaking about that. You want to have someone local. So in that sense, you know, there is some strategy to that, too. But we would love for our projects to reach internationally. And we have many that have. Mission US, the game that, that was uh, funded from both NEH and NEA um, over the years, uh, has an incredibly broad international audience. And we're thrilled with that. Um, but it needs to be for U.S. audiences first, at least in terms of distribution and outreach, um, and then you can build from there, and, and we hope you do. Next question. Thank you, Dr. Hi, this isn't so much a question as a, as a shameless plug. I'm a stealth other federal funder that um, only looked at the program on the train ride up from Washington and realized there was a federal funding forum. So I'm from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, um, and everything that my counterparts have said about the process of applying and, and everything applies to us exactly, and we welcome projects um, from museums and libraries, you partner with them um, to do any kind of gaming project, whether it's um, you know game development uh, for content or game design workshops for computational thinking skills. Uh, so I have material and ask me questions if you want to. Thank you. And, and IMLS. Um, Right in front of you, behind you, behind you. Behind her. <laughs> so uh, David, you mentioned um, being able to get funding for like two to five years uh, over like with a year turnaround. Are there any avenues for like smaller, shorter scale projects um, that any of you guys uh, fund? 
Yeah, there are a number of so small business um, SBIR projects often have a phase one. Um, depending on the agency, Department of Ed, it's like a six month project that you just jump right into and then you can have the potential for developing you know, something much, much broader than that if your phase one is successful. NIH has sort of early stage, high risk, high reward, you know, phase one projects. Uh, and then there's also like additional things as well. So you, know, you can have sort of one year funding if there's an existing grant you know, that, that, that's already there and you want to say, well, you've, you're already doing this certain you know, scope of research, but what if we added some game elements to this tool and it improves it and we can you know, show that it'll have better dissemination and, and user retention, that sort of thing. So you can, have, you can submit for like you know, uh, administrative supplements um, that don't go through such a daunting review process and uh, you know, a number of folks have been successful using that, uh, that kind of approach as well. Thank you. Uh, for us at the NEA, it's actually a little bit different. For us, it's the maximum of two years project phase, but since we think in project phases, you could come into us just for outreach or just for research and development. Could be a six month project, could be three months, but I think it's nicer to kind of take that full year for, you know, to take your time with the project, so. We have time for one more question, so. Any burning questions? All right. Well, thank you. I want to thank our panelists. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and, and this Closing is, remarks. so we <laughs> partially pitched this out over social media, but this uh -huh. is the perfect place to announce it. Um, if you weren't aware already, if you go to waldengame.com and you're an educator, um, you actually get free access to the game. Um, and there is a little form that you'll fill out, and we're quite thrilled to push this out to educational communities, and by all means, take advantage of a gorgeous game. Um, and it is completely free, and we just ask that, uh, that you spread the word about that. Um, as It is waldengame.com. And, and then Walden is on display in our marketplace also on the second floor in the cafeteria, so you can play it all day today too if you wanna get a sample. <laughs> um, David, did you have any announcements to make? Uh, nothing additional, I think I mentioned okay. the SEPA, Science Education okay. Partnership Awards. Um, you know, you can Google all these different things, and uh, I'm giving a talk this afternoon that sort of further expands on the sort of funding opportunities that my agency and some other sister agencies do as well. Anything else? Or, all right. Thank you so much um, to our awesome panelists. Hope you all learned some valuable uh, tools. Um, thank you, Sarah.